I would like to kindly ask you all to mute yourselves and switch off your video cameras so that we ensure that we've got a clear line, please. Any questions that you may have for our speakers, please send them via chat box that you have on your screen. This will then be read and answered after all the speakers have delivered their respective address at the end of this launch. Thank you. May I ask His Excellency Archbishop Ignatius Kaigama from Nigeria to lead us in the opening prayer. Monsignor Kaigama. Of your introduction, but I know you have said I should say an opening prayer. And so I begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you for a day like this in which we gather to reflect together from different parts of the world. We want to talk on an issue that concerns us and helps our progress, that is religious freedom. Bless us with your presence, guide us with your Holy Spirit, and may all our discussions here be fruitful and helpful to us and indeed to the whole world. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. We will start off now with a short video. Please put the sound on, Alex. Alex, the sound. We're not hearing accelerated anything. significantly since okay, the thanks. survey in 2018. Close to 4 billion people live in the 26 countries classified as suffering the most intense attacks on religious freedom. Almost 50% of these countries are in Africa. Over the last two years, transnational jihadist groups who systematically persecute all those who do not accept the extremist Islamist ideology have consolidated their presence in sub-Saharan Africa. While a big part of the territory is not accessible to humanitarian aid workers, governments are either unable or, in some cases, apparently unwilling to address the issue. Only recently have multinational task forces been established to help the local governments. In Asia, China and North Korea are the worst offenders where religious freedom is non-existent, as are the majority of human rights. In China, state control is increasingly oppressive. Mass surveillance, including artificial intelligence, refined technology, a social credit system that rewards and punishes individual behavior, and brutal crackdowns on religious and ethnic groups enforce the state supremacy. This is particularly evident through mass internment and coercive re-education programs affecting more than a million mostly Muslim ethnic Uyghurs in Xinjiang province. In Myanmar, ongoing assaults against Christians and Hindus in Kachin state have been cast in the shadow of a massive multi-phased attack by the military and other armed groups against the one million mostly Muslim Rohingya population in Rakhine state. A growing challenge to religious freedom in Asia comes from expanding ethno-religious nationalist movements. 
The trend affects billions in this continent, mainly in democratic or semi-democratic <coughs> contexts, such as Hindu majority, India, and the Buddhist majority, Sri Lanka and Myanmar. The profound impact of religious freedom violations is most evident in Pakistan, where vulnerable women and girls of minority faith groups are abducted, raped, and obliged to change their faith in so-called forced conversions. The rights of these girls and women are so comprehensively denied that they become slaves. In the 36 countries marked in orange in our categorization, more religious freedom is neither enjoyed nor constitutionally guaranteed. During the period under review, President Erdogan of Turkey took steps to position the country as a global Sunni power, threatening the rights of other faiths in the process, as exemplified by the conversion of the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul into a mosque. Islam is promoted in every aspect of public life. In some states in the Middle East, South and Central Asia, and the former Soviet countries, freedom of worship is guaranteed, but not full religious freedom. Furthermore, in some countries, conversion from the majority religion is forbidden by law, while in others, suppressed as a result of strong societal pressures. The COVID-19 pandemic had profound implications for human rights, including that of religious freedom. Militant groups have taken advantage of governments who have been distracted by the need to concentrate on tackling the pandemic. In Africa, for example, Islamist extremists have increased attacks, thereby entrenching territorial gains and recruiting new members. Pre-existing societal prejudices against minority religious communities also led to increased discrimination, for example, in Pakistan, where Muslim charities denied Christians and members of other minority faith groups access to food and medical aid. In the West, emergency measures taken in response to the pandemic impacted freedom of assembly and religious freedom, prompting criticism and debate. In this report, we have introduced for the first time a new category titled Countries Under Observation where we have observed new factors which could have a significant impact on religious freedom in the future. Evidence for this category is the violent demonstrations in Latin America, where protesters attacked and destroyed religious symbols and property. In some regions, violent hate crimes were carried out against religious leaders and members of the faithful. Pope Francis has defined what he terms polite persecution, in which evolving values and new cultural norms have consigned religions to what he calls the quiet obscurity of the individual conscience. For example, in the West, the right to conscientious objection on religious grounds for healthcare professionals in relation to issues concerning abortion and euthanasia is no longer meaningfully protected by law. But the period under review has also seen significant change for the better. There was important progress in terms of religious dialogue and faith leaders were able to play an increasingly important role in conflict resolution, helping to bring warring sides to the negotiating table. The visits of Pope Francis to the United Arab Emirates resulted in the signing of a document titled Human Fraternity for World Peace and Living Together. Dramatic world events, be they in Africa, Asia, or indeed in the Middle East, have led to an unprecedented rise in that most serious of claims, namely genocide. The Religious Freedom Report reflects the mission of ACN to be a voice for those who are suffering and silenced as a result of persecution. As Pope Francis said in 2015, in a world where various forms of modern tyranny seek to suppress religious freedom, it is imperative that the followers of the various religions join their voices in calling for peace, tolerance, and respect for the dignity and rights of others. Thank you very much. Um, we shall have some changes in our program so that we will start off with Father Spiridon Kabash to deliver his speech as he needs to attend community prayers by six. I will then deliver my speech after his. 
Father Spiridon is a priest in the Antiochian Orthodox Archdiocese of Homs, Syria, and director of Orthodox Center for Social Services and Development, OSDC, and an iconographer. He has a license in theology and philosophy. Father Spiridon wrote the icon of the Blessed Virgin Mary, mother of sorrows and consolatrix of the Syrian people, as part of the Console My People, a campaign of prayer for Syrian Christians sponsored by ACN alongside the Catholic and Orthodox churches in Syria. I now kindly ask Father Spiridon to deliver his speech. Father Spiridon. Thank you, thank you for all. You, you, you hear me? Yes, I hear, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Um, prepared to speak in Arabic and uh, my friend, uh, Iyad, he will uh, translate to English if it's possible, because my English, it's not very good. No okay? problem, no problem, no problem. So I'll ask you no. بعد الحرب العالمية الثانية، المسيحيين كانوا عشرين بالمية بسوريا. After World War II, there were twenty percent. They were twelve percent. وبعد وبعد الحرب وعمل العنف من قبل عشر سنين صاروا ثلاثة بالمية. After the the violence acts in Syria in this recent years, in this last ten years, now we are three percent. هذا بيعني إنه المسيحيين بلشوا يختفوا من سوريا. That means this means that the Syrian Father Spiridon, we're not hearing you. Oh. Father Spiridon? Uh, bishops, uh, soldier, and men and women and children. Now in Syria, there is a, a big problem, big problem in uh, with the, the the Christian people because we 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 uh, we have. Uh, we have a problem in in a, a economical problem because uh, the war making the people more poor and uh, the young uh, people here now they thinking about traveling to Europe you know or America or mm -hmm. so uh, the the situation here uh, it's very dangerous, and the Excellency Mario Zinari, he is an embassy for, from Vatican here. He speak uh, uh, last year about the, uh, this uh, this uh, situation, and he explained how the Christian in Syria suffering, you know, and. Uh, we need help from all the world too. Uh, 
make a, a people here uh, uh, to, to 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 keep him in this uh, in this uh, in this um, country because this is very important. We lost you, Father Spiridon. Father Spiridon. Please excuse us for this, but the line seems to be a bit you hear I believe we have to move on. Thank you, Father Spiridon, for unfortunately your speech, but as things stand, we couldn't hear that much, as well as for accepting to share your experience with us today. Please send our regards to your people and assure them of our prayers. Thank you. This brings us to my speech for today. In a world where various forms of modern tyranny seek to suppress religious freedom or try to reduce it to a subculture without any rights to a voice in the public sphere or to use religion as a pretext for hatred and brutality, it is imperative that the followers of the various religions join their voices in calling for peace, tolerance, and respect for the dignity and rights of others. With these words of the Holy Father, Pope Francis, I welcome you warmly to this all important event, which is at the heart of our mission. In fact, Aid to the Church in Need, in short ACN, is the only international Catholic organization dedicated to helping persecuted and oppressed Christians in the world today. Due to challenges posed by the coronavirus pandemic, we are unable to hold a physical conference this year. I thank you for joining us on this platform for the launch of the 15th edition of the Religious Freedom in the World Report today. We are delighted to have with us today esteemed speakers from Iraq, Nigeria, Syria, Malta, and Germany, who will be sharing with us their experience of religious freedom in their own part of the world. Thank you very much, Archbishop Bashar Warda, Archbishop Ignatius Kaigama, Monsignor Professor Hector Sherry, Father Spiridon Kabash, and Miss Regina Lynch for gracing us with your presence. The Religious Freedom in the World Report, published every two years, is ACN's principal research project and has evolved considerably over the years from initially being a small booklet for its first editions to becoming a publication of approximately 800 pages produced by a worldwide team. The evolution is due to the fact that today, discrimination and persecution on the grounds of religious belief is a growing global phenomenon. Article 18 of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948 states that everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief, and freedom either alone or in community with others, and in public or private, to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. 
This declaration was endorsed and recognized by the Holy See in 1965 in the Second Vatican Council's Declaration on Human Freedom, Dignitatis Humanae, which added that this right to religious freedom stems from the dignity of the human person. Contrary to these provisions, millions of believers continue to suffer more and more infringements of this basic human right. Religious freedom is under threat as never before. As we will see, over 5.2 billion people live in countries where religious freedom is violated. Let me walk you through a few highlights drawn from this report. As we can see, an astonishing one out of every three countries in the world suffer violations of religious freedom. The 26 countries in the red category indicating persecution are home to 3,900 million people, just over half, 51% of the world's population. This classification includes 12 African countries and two countries where investigations are ongoing for possible genocide, China and Myanmar or Burma. The 36 countries in the orange category indicating discrimination are home to 1,240 million people where full religious freedom is neither enjoyed nor constitutionally guaranteed. Religious freedom is violated in almost one third of the world's countries where two thirds, 67% of the world's population live. The number of people living in these countries is close to 5,200 million. 62 countries out of a total of 196, again here in red, face severe violations of religious freedom as the worst offenders include some of the most populous nations in the world, China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Nigeria. Among the many findings, perhaps the most important factors impacting religious freedom today include authoritarian governments, for example, Marxist dictatorships in North Korea and China, Islamist extremism, particularly evident in Sub-Saharan Africa with the rise of transnational jihadist groups and ethnic religious nationalism. That is the promotion of ethnic and religious supremacy in some Hindu and Buddhist majority countries in Asia. So let's have a closer look at some of the findings. First of all, the continent of Africa and the topic of Islamist extremism. Violations of religious freedom, the countries marked in orange, include terrorism and desecration of places of worship. This occurs in 23 countries. More serious, however, is the dangerous growth of persecution, those countries marked in red. As previously mentioned, 26 countries in the world suffer persecution. Almost half of these countries are in Africa. Extreme persecution with unimaginable ferocity, such as torture and mass killings, is now occurring in 12 African countries. The countries of East and West Africa are home to a complex mosaic of ethnic, religious, and linguistic groups and a prominently youthful population. While the region has considerable human and natural resources, problems of poverty, corruption, and the lack of educational and employment opportunities for young people results in frustration and social instability. This is readily explored by local and transnational criminal and jihadist groups. Sub-Saharan Africa has become a haven for over two dozen extremist groups actively operating and increasingly cooperating in 14 countries. Research reveals that the number of people killed by armed groups in Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Chad, and Mali, just in the first quarter of 2020, more than doubled compared to the same period in 2019. In Burkina Faso, in February 2019, 65,000 people were displaced by terrorist groups. Only 12 months later, in February 2020, no less than 765,000 people had been displaced by terrorist groups. The violence is unimaginable. 
in early November 2020, 15 boys and five adults were decapitated with machetes by Islamic State insurgents during an initiation rite for teenage boys. These massacres followed an earlier mass attack in April 2020, in which an estimated 52 men were killed in the village of Shitashi after refusing to join the ranks of the jihadists. This radicalization affects not just the African continent. The ACN report reveals the rise of transnational Islamist networks with ideological and material support from the Middle East, stretching from Mali to Mozambique in Sub-Saharan Africa, to the Comoros Islands in the Indian Ocean, and to the Philippines, Mindanao, in the South China Sea, with the aim of creating a so-called transcontinental caliphate. Here, the issue of concern is ethno-religious nationalism, the promotion of ethnic and religious supremacy in some Hindu and Buddhist majority countries in Asia, which has led to even greater oppression of minorities. Several countries in mainland Asia continue to be governed by Marxist one-party dictatorships. These include North Korea, where the policy towards faith groups can be understood as extremationist. In China, there is mass surveillance, including artificial intelligence refined technology, a social credit system that rewards and punishes individual behavior, and brutal crackdowns on religious and ethnic groups to enforce the supremacy of the state. A new category has been introduced in this report, specifically countries under observation, where emerging factors have been observed drawing concern to the impact of these on freedom of religion. This is most tangibly demonstrated through an increase in hate crimes with a religious bias against people and poverty. These range from vandalism against places of worship and religious symbols to violent crimes against faith leaders and the faithful. The period under review also considers the profound impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the right to religious freedom. Faced with the magnitude of the emergency, governments have deemed it necessary to impose extraordinary measures, in some cases, applying disproportionate limitations on religious worship as compared to other secular activities. In some countries, such as Pakistan or India, humanitarian aid was withheld from religious minorities. Especially in social networks, the pandemic was also used as a pretext to stigmatize certain religious groups for allegedly spreading causing the pandemic. There were positive steps in the period under review. One such development is the reapproachment between Christians and non-extremist and non-fundamentalist Muslims led by Pope Francis. Following his meeting with the Grand Imam Ahmad al-Tayyab al-Azhar, the leader of the Sunni Muslim world in 2019, the two religious leaders met again in 2020 in the United Arab Emirates to co-sign the Abu Dhabi Declaration on Human Fraternity. This papal visit to the UAE was marked by the first ever celebration of a papal mass on the Arabian Peninsula. The visit of Pope Francis to Iraq last March, his first to a Muslim Shiite majority country, will hopefully increase inter-religious dialogue and help highlight the dire situation of re religious minorities in Iraq and beyond. This report is not only a means through which a better, to better fulfill the service of ACN to the suffering church, but also a way to give a voice to ACN's project partners, those who have been tragically marked by the consequences of persecution. I therefore invite you all to stay connected and listen with rapt attention, as I am sure you will, to find the talks interesting and thought-provoking. Thank you very much. This brings us to the next round of speakers, starting with His Excellency Archbishop Warda. Unfortunately, 
Archbishop Marta could not be with us today, uh, but he sent us, he so kindly sent us um, a video which, which he passed on, he will be passing the message through this means. Thank you. Born in Baghdad, Archbishop Warda. Good evening. Thanks to. Born in Baghdad, Archbishop Bashar Warda knows firsthand the difficulties facing Iraqi Christians. Yet, he also knows the beauty and strength of the people's faith. He himself grew up in a devout family with his three sisters and four brothers. My Catholic faith was at the center of my life, my family and my community, he says. The, my formation was very strong with the priests and sisters at school, as well as through being catechized and being very much involved in the church and youth activities. He was ordained a priest in 1993 after graduating from St. Peter's Chaldean Seminary in Iraq. Two years later, he joined the Redemptorist Order of Flanders, Belgium. Priesthood, he says, is a calling, and he always wanted to will the good of the other, especially in responding to the pastoral needs of the young people, and had been done as had been done for me growing up. After earning a master's degree in theology in 1999 from the Catholic University of Louvain, Belgium, he returned to Iraq. He served as rector of St. Peter's Chaldean Seminary, and he was consecrated as Archbishop of Erbil in 2010. Archbishop Warda has been dedicated to preaching the gospel and nourishing the faith amid the heightened persecution, terrorism, and the unrest throughout recent decades. He has also aided Christian refugees and promoted interfaith dialogue. In December 2015, he founded the Catholic University in Erbil, the country's only Catholic university, which is located in the Northern Kurdistan region. Growing Christianity's presence in Iraq and rebuilding the church there remains a challenge. Nevertheless, Archbishop Warda finds the greatest reward in seeing the joy of the young people taking part in the church mission. Let's see together the message from Archbishop Warda. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks to all the participants and those who are helping the religiously persecuted people in this world. I thank our long partner with ACN for their long supportive and faithful walk with us. But it has been one of the too many years. I don't say that uh, disrespectfully, but our troubles to survive in our homeland of over 2000 years seems to be never ending. Meaning that we have to constantly seek help from our humanitarian brothers and sisters. To survive in a country torn apart by sectarianism is a difficult for the majorities, but for the minorities in Iraq, it's extreme daily challenge, most especially for Christians and Yazidis. I'll speak uh, about this in four things. Uh, the first being a brief history uh, and our current situation. The aftermath of the 2003 invasion led to sectarianism. Christians were a key target due to their friendly relationships uh, in the West. In fact, we were blamed for the invasion by those who wished to find a scapegoat or an excuse. History repeats itself as the Christians were subject to retaliation when the British left after their mandates in 1932 with the 1933 massacre in Semel where over 300 Christians were murdered in the village by the Iraqi army. We remain a people without full citizen rights since 2003, over 60 churches and shrines have been destroyed. 
more than 25,000 homes seized, 150,000 Christians displaced, countless Christians have been kidnapped or murdered, no person have, has been brought to justice for the after mention of the murder of Father Rohit Genni and his three subdeacons in Mosul in 2007 outside the church. There are others Christians, martyrs, including Bishop Faraj Rahu, Father Paul Siskander, Pastor Munder al Saqqa, Father Yusuf uh, Aboudi, Thar Abdal, Father Wasim Sabih al Qas. We are a martyr church, believing that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. It is, it is not acceptable in any society to have such suffering that has been inflicted on the Yazidis and other minorities. The Yazidi suffers most during ISIS with the mass killings in Sinjar, but no one has been brought to justice. I could say that why do not Christians and Yazidis live lives matters, but of course all lives matters. I only say this as where are the Christians protesting against the murder and persecution of our fellow Christians? There are nearly two million, uh, two, two billion Christians around the world, uh, representing 30% of the total world populations. Yet Christianity is the most persecuted religion in the world. Why are they so silent? Martin Luther King said, in the end, it's not the words of the and our enemies, but the silence of our friends. I'm not saying, for example, the BBC are our friends, but I thought that they the rights of all and for all, especially minorities and the racism values. The BBC last year made uh, a major of five part series on the ordinary people from both sides of the conflicts who lived through the 2003 invasion and the 17 years of chaos that followed. In nearly five hours of a major BBC series, they did not mention the words Mandaeen, Shabak, Yazidis, we Christians are only mentioned twice in passing words, not by the narrator, about all living in peace under Saddam Hussein. People who have been in my land for thousands of years are wiped out by one of the world's major public broadcasters. That is sending us a very dark warning. What message is the BBC giving to those who are persecuted us and denies us our rights? This series showed journalistic blindness to the persecuted Iraqi minorities, which is tormented to a saying, we do not matter, should have, should have no voice and do not exist. That in itself is another form of persecution, of persecution as we need our voices fairly heard in the international world, as we need the world to help us to survive as minorities. Not having equal citizen rights is a form of persecution for all of the minorities. When your voice does not count in your own country, you are isolated and without legal protection and justice. The law and constitution makes the minorities second class citizens in the religious state. Added to that, Christian's history is not taught at school 
And this makes it very hard for our fellow Iraqis to understand us, accept our, us, and respect us. And most probably, they think that we emigrated to Iraq with the British soldiers in the last century. On the other hand, the country is in a recession and 70% of the population rely on government jobs in our entire economy. Most families in Nineveh Plain, for example, have not worked since ISIS uh, attack in August 2014. Since the right to return to the villages in May 2017, there have been no significant livelihood programs and most of the villages have an excess of 75% employment. Therefore, people have had to survive on saving and relatives in the diaspora. But that has been going on since 1991 and cannot continue. As money uh, is not circulating, uh, it's then become an ever increasing vicious cycle of how to survive for all the Catholic communities and minorities. The financial waves of the community were further uh, exacerbated with the pandemic uh, and the governments reducing the amount they pay for salaries for those who have jobs and pensioners, paying it five months late on the 22nd of December, Baghdad devalued the Iraqi dinner by 20% from 1,182 to 1,450 to the US dollar, which all of are so dependent upon. The Archdiocese cannot let down its flock and we reached out for support and providing school and university scholarships, uh, medicine, operations, food, uh, basket foods, rental, uh, pensioners, and the list continued. Without jobs, people do not have the dignity to house, clothes, uh, feed, and educate their families. I thank uh, wholeheartedly ACN for all it has been done and recently with providing uh, 45,000 euros factory oxygen machines for the Mariamana hospital during the pandemic. It should be noted that we have helped the Muslim community with oxygens and medicine during this pandemic. Secondly, who are the key players after, uh, that affect our existence. We live in an Islamic religious state's government controlled by Islam. It is a world recognized that the government is corrupt, as seen by the peaceful protesters in 2019-2020. We get no help from the Baghdad government. In Nineveh Plain, the militias poses a continuing problem. People fear the militias and what the militias wants to achieve. They pose a huge problem, both demographically, politically, and for the civilians. Slowly but surely, we lose control of our villages that were once the Christian's majority. The lack of security is a major source of instability. It leads to fear uh, and lack of capital investments for jobs. Therefore, people will leave. Thirdly is the miraculous papal visit. It was wonderful that the world could see our ancient country, the cradle of civilization, in a different light mobilized and united to find successful paths towards a religious coexistence, reconciliation, and social cohesions. 
we were all brothers and sisters for three days and it has not happened since 2003 and probably before only the pope could have done this i found the visit to be miraculous and incredibly uplifting his holiness sowed great seeds of forgiveness hope and peace for the future i know that the spirit of the message from his holiness will felt all over iraq we are all iraqis wanting to share a common feeling on nationhood all people need to be treated with dignity as equal citizens of iraq regardless of faith his holiness stressed on this fact that we were all and we are all children of god loved equally by him the visit has shown to all here that we have been here since the second century and we are very much part of this rich culture of this nation i believe that this will help us a lot uh, as muslims have also have been denied knowing our major contribution to this land for over 2000 years especially in health and education the much publicized meeting with the the grand ayatollah ali al-sistani and his holiness was vital it sent a message of unity that has been received very positively uh, by the people and the media throughout the iraq for the grand ayatollah to mention christian citizen rights rather than iraqi rights was hugely significant in the last few weeks before the pope came we have been seeing more interest in christians and their pop, uh, property rights for example the al Sadr party has formed a new committee to investigate property stolen uh, from christians this is a genuine and most welcoming initiatives as many uh, properties have been seized as i said before especially in the Nineveh plain and of course we have to see the results of this committee the visits of his holiness shows christians as minority within iraq have contributed to bringing a very divided country together as pope francis said we all are brothers and sisters together the Catholic University in Erbil, CUE, and the 300 volunteers uh, it arranged was uh, the center of the planning and operations to make the Papal Mass an incredible moving and spiritual experience that was a huge worldwide success. Fourthly, what needs to happen? We need to build on the momentum His Holiness has brought to Iraq. It is a call for the international community, aid agencies, to very actively work on the, for the future uh, of, the, of the country. We have to compete for the ever-decreasing resources of overseas aid, and especially now with the COVID-19 crisis. However, we need a united and collective response from humanitarian aid uh, agencies to deliver livelihood programs and not piecemeal attempts as, uh, as it is probably not working with such high level of unemployment for the Christians and Yazidis. We do not want the minorities to flee to their uh, country or to wherever we want them to stay and rebuild their lives and their country in a long-term safe environment. We thank the humanitarian aid agencies for their aid in this uh, crisis, but there needs to be a concentrated plan. 70% uh, 
of the Yazidis have not uh, have been systematically violated and displaced. They are not now left. Uh, they are now left traumatized and unemployment with the unknown future without structure or the possibility of cultural survival. It is a community in a social fragmentation. Too many words over the, too many years. Bloodness by the international community. Please do not be uh, diplomats on on an one or two years posting, but to be passionate about making changes. Yes, you will fall feathers, but you will save the remnant minorities if you are bold and courageous. No, this is now down to your governments. But please, we are disappearing in the front of your consulates, all within three to four hours driving from your offices to the Nineveh Plain and Sinjar. Something is clearly not working. So we are appeal for a united EU, UK and the US to collectively help us or it will be the end of our ancient minorities. The Pope is setting a model for going to where the other is and is speaking to him as he has done in his other Middle East visits. This is what God wants us to do. And I remind the international community about this. Constant dialogue must be brought to bear in divided uh, societies to transform them into a civil and cooperative ones. The British Lord Acton said that the freedom of a country is the, is the amount of security enjoyed by the minorities. Outside of Kurdistan, this freedom does not exist and the international community that sit in Erbil and in Baghdad is very aware of the security situation. We need their determination, commitment, and passion to protect the persecuted so that they can remain in their homeland. They need to collectively put consecrated pressure on Iraqi, regard, Iraqi government regarding uh, all of these issues. The international community should hold uh, a conference in Iraq on religious freedom and the huge benefits of peace it brings to society, where those who have been, who have suffered the world needs to educate and inform generations after generations about genocides and its preventions. We have lost the Mandaeen, the Jewish, who have been in Iraq for thousands of years. We do not want to be the next. There has to be long-term efforts and willingness to bring international investors to the country. When you do not feed people, they either leave or pick up arms. We saw the disaster outcomes when most of the Iraqi army were made unemployed. We need to pay respect and head what the peaceful protesters wanted. The country wants peace and the international community needs to help and assist in this matter. In summary, we face many issues and challenges as Christians and Yazidis face the same issues and challenges. Unless the political change, the international community became together with Baghdad, the Christians and Yazidis are giving equal rights of the nationhood, security is addressed, livelihood programs uh, introduced, then what hope is there for, the, for us? A major beacon of hope 
are we? The structure that we built for our people, churches, hospital, a seminary, four schools, a new hospital, I finish on the Catholic University of, of Erbil. The university is a key structure to keep Christianity in Iraq. The CUE will play a central role in educating Iraqi society about Christianity through, through, uh, through events and seminars with the aim towards reconciliation, justice, peace, and social cohesions. The university will create critical thinkers who do not only will be able to compete in the job market, but will provide future leaders within the communities and villages. If we can envision 1,000 plus students at the Catholic University in Erbil by 2025, 2026, we can continually and effectively through the numbers be powerful, sowing great seed for social cohesion, justice, critical thinking, and religious coexistence. We will be affecting all of the communities within the Kurdistan and into Iraq. The university will be a center for learning that provides platforms for academics and researchers from all from around the world, access to a key country in the Middle East for debates, discussion and research in a safe environment. The more events that we have, the more powerful will become our message of unity and equality for all. A university that is for the minorities that welcomes a significant percentage of Muslims and Yazidis. It's a pride of the minorities and the marginalized have their own education institution that allows equality for all. It, this cannot be achieved at any other university in, in Iraq. I thank uh, the Aid to the Church in Need, ACN, for becoming first foundational core donor for the scholarship program uh, for the CUE. They will support 150 new students for the duration of their degrees from 2021 until 2024, 25. We need to find more core donors to achieve 1,000 students by 2025. Without a doubt, the CUE is a beacon of light and some symbol of hope for the young people of Iraq. The provision of the scholarships will be an immense support. This international aid will not only benefit young people who are hoping for better future, but at the same time gives a clear future through education for the Christians, all the other minorities and the disadvantaged. We want to have the tools and opportunities to stay in our country and to build bridges of peace and coexistence. We thank you for your commitment, your hard work, your continued help and support to our mission. Thank you and God bless you all. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. It's very inspiring, as well as detailed yet concise speech, as well as your dedicated energy towards the people of God. I now ask His Excellency Archbishop Ignatius Kai Gama to deliver his speech. His Grace, Most Reverend Dr. Ignatius Kai Gama, is the Archbishop of the Archdiocese of Abuja, Nigeria's capital and president of the West African Bishops' Conference. He is the immediate past president of the Catholics' Bishops' Conference of Nigeria and has been outspoken on the situation facing Nigerian Christians. As a strong promoter of peace and interreligious dialogue, Archbishop Kai Gama founded the Dialogue, Reconciliation and Peace, DREP, Center in Jos, and has worked as chair of the Plateau State Interreligious Council for Peace 
and Harmony, and chair of the Christian Association of Nigeria for years. He was also a member of the Sol Solomon Lar Presidential Committee, mandated by the federal government to look into the causes of the plateau ethno-religious crisis and to prefer ways to bring them to an end. The Archbishop's interreligious work includes being a founding member of Nigeria's interfaith activity and partnership for peace, dedicated to providing a credible and trusted platform for dialogue between people of different faiths, including efforts to work out modalities for stemming the rising tensions between Christians and Muslims and strategies for combating the Boko Haram challenge. He is a recipient of many international peace awards, including the Golden Dove Peace Award, Italy 2012, San Valentino Peace Award from the Diocese of Terni Narni, Amelia in Italy 2013, the UF UK Dialogue Foundation in 2014, as well as several other local awards. Your Excellency. Please. Unmute yourself, I believe, yes. You need to unmute yourself. Sorry. Okay. Yes, I said thank you, Stephen. And uh, I greet my fellow participants. I'm speaking from Abuja in Nigeria and I'm happy to be part of this forum as we discuss religious freedom in the world and the ACN report about this for 2021. I'm talking about Nigeria. Each time we talk about Nigeria, we give a litany of issues that constitute the deprivation of religious freedom. When we mention groups that keep fighting like Boko Haram and they want to deny people their rights to both social, political, and religious freedom, the situation is still the same. But today I present Nigeria in this perspective about religious freedom. Responding to the immediate past US Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, who in a Twitter statement of 7th December 2020, blacklisted Nigeria for engaging in systematic religious freedom violations. Nigeria's information minister, Lai Mohammed, claimed in a response that Nigeria jealously protects religious freedom as enshrined in the country's constitution and takes seriously any infringements in this regard. He, I quote him, he said, Nigeria does not engage in religious freedom violation, neither does it have a policy of religious persecution. That is the Minister of Information talking. The minister's statement may be true in a sense because the variety of religious activities by both Muslims and Christians at the superficial level may be said to be an indication of religious freedom. Also, the ubiquitous presence of churches and mosques competing for attention by, uh, by the highways and in towns and villages, the huge financial resources spent by both the state and federal government annually on Christian and Muslim pilgrimages to Jerusalem and Mecca could be cited as evidence of religious freedom which Nigeria enjoys. One can, however, fault the view of Nigeria's Minister of Information by referring to the detention 
of the leadership and members of the Shiite Islamic movement in Nigeria, a group that has been at loggerheads with the government for decades. We can cite their suppression and oppression as evidence of the denial of religious freedom. Also, Christians for many years and decades now worry a lot about issues that seem to put Christians and Christianity under pressure. The current acts of kidnapping, as you hear in the news, the kidnapping for ransom of priests, even including bishops, students, senior religious leaders, both Christian and Muslim, and the seemingly endless acts of banditry, terrorism, and other acts of criminality deprive Nigerians of the religious freedom to worship in a tranquil environment. It is well known that the primary aim and ambition of Boko Haram is to spread Islam and to forcefully convert Nigerians to Islam. For me, failure to defeat Boko Haram is failure to guarantee religious freedom. Christians believe that there is religious favoritism in Nigeria's civil service. The army, the police, the customs, and other security agencies, as well as key government ministries. The worrisome militant activities of herdsmen encroaching on people's land in different parts of the country is seen by many Christians as a gradual attempt at the Fulanization from the word Fulani, an ethnic group in Nigeria, and Fulanization would mean Fulani attempting to take over Nigeria and also the Islamization of Nigeria. Christians in the core Northern parts of Nigeria where there is a very strong Muslim majority believe there are direct or indirect measures to check the growth and the spread of Christianity in the North. Some examples are including Islamic religious knowledge in the curriculum of primary and secondary schools in Muslim dominated areas, while the teaching of Christian religious knowledge is prohibited. Denial of permits to build churches, denial of employment or promotion in the civil service and or the application of subtle pressure to some officials due for promotion to convert to Islam. We also have Islamic Emirates where the large, large Christian populations are imposed. They, they, they impose emirs, traditional rulers on them carefully calculated recruitment into the army, the paramilitary bodies and other federal establishments is seen as a strategic plan to favor one religion or ethnic group. The Fulani domination for decades over ethnic minority groups such as the Mabu Zawa in Northwestern Nigeria and ethnic groups in the Middle Belt are clear examples. The story of my Jukun Kona people, the ethnic group I belong to, Jukun Kona, which was attacked by the Fulani in 1892 with the help of the French adventurer, Lieutenant Louis Mison, is proof of this. Only two years ago, the chiefdom of Kona land was granted by the government, and that is a liberation from the Fulani Muslims. What is worrisome and very wor worrisome in Nigeria today is not about the litany of deprivations that Christians suffer, but this unhealthy and unfriendly relationship between Christian and Muslim umbrella organizations antagonizing each other and raising the tension level, which can lead to severe polarization 
and even the disintegration of this country. A typical example is the unnecessary hijab. That is that female veil or head covering Muslims use. The hijab controversy in Pahara State, then government got involved in, by insisting that female Muslim students in Christian-run schools be allowed to wear the hijab. They, they have a common uniform. But you want to introduce discrimination by saying the Muslim girls should wear a hijab different from the Christians. That, is, that was seen to be unacceptable. We thought that the government should be more concerned about focusing on improving the standard of education or the structures, physical structures of schools, the teaching of good ethical conduct and, and patriotism. There are threats and counter threats from Muslims and Christians when these kind of things happen. There is, the tension is so high that I am afraid of what this can lead to. The attempt to introduce a bill on religious discrimination, prohibition, prevention bill in 2021 in the House of Representatives was another distraction, as the Christians viewed it as an attempt to entrench the wearing of hijab in favor of Muslims. Similarly, Nigeria's membership of what was the Organization of Islamic Conference, OIC, continues to raise eyebrows. The confession of Dr. Issa Pantami, Minister of Communication and Digital Economy, admitting that in the past he expressed, um, out of ignorance anyway, he said, out of ignorance and youthful exuberance, he expressed views sympathetic to Al Qaeda, Taliban, and groups with pro jihad positions. And his declarations that the killing of unbelievers makes him happy. This is a serving minister who in the past had this frame of mind and thought. This pitched him, you know, the supporters of this minister on one side who would be largely Muslims and from the North against the others, critics who are from largely from the South and Christians. And today the, that suspicion is so, so tense, so strong that Christians are talking of Islamization of Nigeria and the Muslims are claiming there is Islamophobia. But what is the most utmost concern today is the threat to Nigeria's corporate existence or the possibility of a religious conflict. It's not, it's not even about Muslims you know, killing Christians or what, is to even survive as a nation is a problem. There is poverty, there is criminality, there is religious extremism and kidnapping, terrorism, militancy, and banditry. And I think these are the things that can bring about the collapse of Nigeria if we do not take time. So more concrete help in terms of intelligence gathering, intelligence information, and equipment to fight these crimes is needed from the international community so that these crimes don't cripple or destroy Nigeria, which will be catastrophic for the entire Africa. Religious freedom can only thrive in a favorable socioeconomic environment and in an environment of peace and tranquility. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for that enlightening speech and your relentless efforts to support our persecuted brethren. I would like now to invite Ms. Regina Lynch, our ACN International Project Director, to deliver her speech. Ms. Lynch has a team of 35 persons divided into 12 project sections, Africa, Asia, Near and Middle East, Latin America and Eastern Europe. Together, they study between 6,000 and 6,500 projects per year, according to certain criteria and priorities. She has witnessed what it means to be a voice to the voiceless. Regina, please. Thank, thank you very much and good evening to everybody. Um, I would just like to start by saying every year we help in somewhere around 140 different countries worldwide. So this means that we are also 
helping in many of these countries where religious freedom is at risk or is already uh, deprived. How much we can do depends a lot on the, the political situation. But this also means that we hear a lot uh, from the witnesses on the ground, our project partners, about the situation. And this is also an important source for the Religious Freedom Report. I, uh, in order to be brief, I just wanted to mention this evening uh, two countries as examples, uh, one in Africa and, and one in Asia, where we have great concern about the question of religious freedom. And the first one, which Stephen mentioned earlier, uh, is of course Mozambique, where at the moment we were receiving shocking reports and photos from our project partners about the barbaric attacks by jihadists who call themselves the Alu Suna Wayama uh, and who claim two years ago to have joined the Islamic State. They operate in the north of the country, in the province of Cabo Delgado, which has huge resources in natural gas and other riches as well. And anyone, be it Muslim or Christian, who does not accept their extremist ideology pays with their life or are subject to cruel forms of torture or see their houses and their crops burnt in front of their eyes. Unfortunately, this is an example of what we see in other countries of how a government's neglect of a certain population and the unjust use of profit from natural resources only encourages the growth of extremists and especially among young, about the youth, the young people who see no opportunity to build a dignified life for them and for their, their families. And so they are easily enticed to the, by these groups uh, and by the propaganda that is spread by them. Now, SCN in Mozambique, since uh, the end of last year and beginning of this year, we have provided and are still providing emergency support, um, food and medical support to the hundreds of thousands of displaced from this region. It's not easy at the moment, but uh, we are managing to get through. And the other important way that we can help is the trauma healing. Given what these people have experienced and seen, especially the children, you can imagine what, how it affects them and how it leaves them. So moving from Mozambique, I would like to mention a country in Asia where is great concern, and that is India. Um, the anti-conversion laws in India, which are present in many of the states, have been a source of concern for quite some time now for our project partners. Our project partners, that's the Catholic Church, whose aim is really to help uplift the million, millions of Indians who live in poverty through education and basic health care. But what we have seen now added to this already is the increasingly aggressive religious nationalism, which is propagated by the BJP, the ruling party, and directed at all non-Hindus, and it's really aggravating the plight of the poor even more. A worrying recent change in fiscal laws could almost be interpreted, as far as we're concerned, as a further attempt to hamper the social and development work with the marginalized that is done by the Christian churches. One particularly worrying case for us is that of Father Stan Swamy, He's an 84-year-old Jesuit priest who has been in prison since the 8th of October, 2020. And why is he in prison? He's accused of having links with extremist groups. Now, on the 22nd of March, 21, he applied for bail and he was denied this despite suffering from a very severe form of Parkinson disease. We at SEN, it's the Church in Need. We have helped the church, the Catholic Church in India for many, many years. 
And uh, currently, this last couple of years, we are granting around 5 million euros a year for the activities of the church all over India. Finally, I'd like to say, I think an important way for ASEAN also to contribute to this question of how to counteract, how to counteract uh, religious, a lack of religious freedom are the projects where we have for um, raising awareness or raising tolerance among the groups. For example, we support now an institute in West Africa and Mali, where, which is run by the missionaries of Africa, where Christians from countries where they are a minority, where the Islamic faith is a majority, can come and study and learn about Islam with the idea that this would help them where it's possible to enter into dialogue with their brothers of the Islamic faith. Uh, another two projects in the Middle East or in, in the Holy Land, I would mention is we support every year an initiative in Bethlehem where Muslims and Christians come together to learn tolerance, understanding, to, to erase prejudices. And then on the other side of the wall in Jerusalem, we have a program that we've been supporting for many years as well, where people of the Jewish and Christian faith come together to learn tolerance and to, to, to take away prejudice that have been there maybe for a long time. And finally, I was very happy that uh, His Grace Archbishop Warda mentioned the Catholic University, because this is a project that we are really we're very excited about. Uh, ACN has done a lot in the years of restoring the houses in the Middle Plains, um, the structures, the church now, the church houses, the, the convents and so on, which are very important. But I think now is the time also has come to invest in the people and to invest in the youth. And as his grace mentioned, the university is a place where young Christians, young Yazidis and young Muslims can come together to also learn terror, uh, tolerance of each other and how to live together. So that I would just like to underline that um, the emergency help we give is very important in cases where they are displaced because of um, terrorist attacks, of a lack of religious freedom. But I think these projects where uh, people can work together for dialogue is also extremely important. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Regina, for that, for all that you're doing in drying the tears where God weeps. Last but not least, I ask Monsignor Hector Sherry, Ecclesiastical Assistance for Aid to the Church in Need Malta, to deliver his speech. Reverend Professor Sherry is Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Theology and the founder president of the Maltese Patriastics Society. In September 2008, he was appointed president of the Malta Theological Commission and president of the Diocesan Ecumenical Commission. In July 2014, Pope Francis appointed him consultor to the Pontifical Council for the Promotion of Christian Unity. Father Hector, please. Thank you and uh, good evening, dear sisters in Christ, dear brothers in Christ. Authentic Christian discipleship and persecution are the two sides of the same coin. There has never been an era in the last 2000 years when Christians have not been persecuted. Him whom we would call today a senior citizen Simeon, the old man in the temple, when the infant Jesus was presented, stated clearly that the child would grow up to be a sign of contradiction. True disciples of Jesus are called to share this peculiar condition, that of being a sign of contradiction, a challenge to all those who ignore or worse still, trample upon human values, indeed gospel values. In my role as ecclesiastical assistant of ACN Malta, it is my duty to share a few spiritual thoughts. Today's gospel passage is a source of inspiration. 
I do not believe in coincidence, but in God incidence. These um, weeks, Lectio Continua from John's Gospel takes a break today or finds a gap on account of today's feast day of St. Catherine of Siena. Indeed, we have to mind the gap. It is a providential gap which takes us to Matthew's gospel, today's gospel passage from Matthew 11, 25 to 30, which I read. At that time, Jesus exclaimed, I bless you, Father, Lord of heaven and of earth, for hiding these things from the learned and the clever and revealing them to little children. Yes, Father, for that is what it pleased you to do. Everything has been entrusted to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, just as no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are overburdened, and I will give you rest. Shoulder my yoke and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Yes, my yoke is easy and my burden light. In this remarkable text, I am invited and I invite you to join me to see all persecuted Christians, to listen to them, to touch them, to support them, to share in their challenging situations. Challenging in two ways. One, because their existence is being challenged by those who persecute them. Secondly, because by means of their resilience and fortitude, they are challenging, yes, they are challenging those whose intention it is to crush them. And challenging to us to embrace Christian discipleship more faithfully and joyfully. In the text from Matthew, I can identify the little ones with all persecuted Christians. I can identify those to whom the Son chooses to reveal the Father with the millions of persecuted Christians in the countries mentioned this evening and elsewhere. I can see those who labor and are overburdened. They are the modern day martyrs, the prophetic voice of our sisters and brothers who are a sign of contradiction in 2021. The words of the gospel text from Matthew 11, today's gospel passage, have come to life for the umpteenth time last Sunday, the 25th of April, when the 43-year-old Comboni missionary, Father Christian Carlassare, bishop-elect of Rumbek, South Sudan, was shot. This was a targeted shooting of a Christian who will be ordained bishop on Pentecost Sunday, the 23rd of May. Jesus praises the Father for revealing himself to mere children. The distinguished abilities of the intelligent scholar or the witty politician or the prosperous businessman do not serve God's will to reveal himself. Not only do the youngsters mentioned by Jesus not necessarily need to understand how God manifests himself, but they are not even in a position to proclaim his revelation in words, in words. This is the way our God of surprises acts. The Greek word for children in this moving exclamation by our Lord is nepioi. Nepioi, literally, those who do not speak, infants. And yet, and yet God reveals himself to 
and through our persecuted sisters and brothers, through Father Christian in Rumbek and millions of anonymous martyrs, anonymous martyrs who despite being nameless are proclaiming, indeed proclaiming the name above all other names. Jesus shouldering his yoke with us makes him truly Emmanuel, God with us. It is the yoke of love carried in his exemplary meekness and disarming gentleness that will truly set us and all suffering Christians from all other man-made yokes that burden and weigh down the life of all true disciples. Finally, may the good and beautiful shepherd, our Lord Jesus Christ, fascinate us, continue to fascinate us, to fascinate all Christians, fascinate all persecuted disciples, that we aware of the true cost, the true cost of discipleship may remain faithful to our call, the call to bear witness to Easter joy, the call to be, yes, a sign of contradiction, the call to be prophets, both loud and at times voiceless, the call to be the little ones journeying on the hidden path of faithfulness, selflessness, and solidarity. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. We can't hear you, Stephen. We can't hear you. Sorry for that. Thank you very much, Father Hector, for always being there to support our charity, as well as for your spiritual guidance. We now have some time for questions. I believe I've already seen a question direct from Sam from Nigeria asking Regina, is ACN and donors not feeling overwhelmed by the increase in persecution and decline in religious freedom? How do you cope with such a challenge of ever increasing need for aid around the world? Thirdly, is there a report on how Christianity is faring, making progress, Regina, or declining? Yes, thank you. Um, sorry, I can't seem to get my video to work, but I'll, I'll <laughs> my, um, my, my microphone's working. Um, just to say, you know, um, I think what keeps we, us going, and we do see situations where it's getting worse, um, sometimes we see situations where it's getting better, but I think what, what helps us a lot is um, the witness given by our project partners who do not give up despite the challenges, despite the suffering, the persecution that, that they, they are confronted with uh, on a daily basis. And I think uh, when we see how they go on and don't give up, uh, then I think well, we can't either. And a, a few years ago, I remember one of the bishops from Syria said, um, when I spoke to him about the terrible situation in Syria and the, the persecution of Christians, and they said, but, you know, it's been like this since the beginning, since the beginning of Christianity, and we're still here, we have survived. So I think this is, uh, we look to them, to our, our project partners are really very inspiring. And might I just add, um, the topic, the whole topic of COVID this past year, uh, we have seen how selfless uh, the project partners, the bishops, the priests, the sisters, the laity have been in going about the work despite the threat of COVID and quite a number of our project partners have passed away in this past year because of COVID. The, the other question um, about the growth and decline of persecution of Christians. Um, every second year, ACN brings out a book called Persecuted and Forgotten, which focuses on the question of persecution of Christians. So the Religious Freedom Report is about all types of uh, religion, whereas this other book on alternate years is about uh, persecution of Christians. But thanks for your question. Okay. 
Are there any more questions? Anyone else would like to ask questions? Well, that brings us to an end. Um, I see another question from Carmel Bonello to Regina again. <laughs> How is ACN assisting in particular Maltese missionaries? But we're, we're helping, as I said, we're helping all over the world. So there are a few countries where uh, we do come across uh, Maltese missionaries whom we are helping. Um, I was thinking in just coming to mind now, Pakistan, uh, India, uh, Kenya, there, there's a, a bishop there as well. I think we are helping. And um, of course, Libya. Uh, the latest bishop to be appointed in, in Libya is, is Maltese. And as we know, the particular the situation in Libya is really very, very difficult. So um, I have been to Pakistan a few times, and it was always a pleasure to see the fearless uh, Maltese missionaries that, that we met there. So uh, you can see that you still have a very Catholic country, which is very encouraging. Yeah, in fact, another question is saying many Maltese think that the worst period of persecution of Christians was during the first three centuries, Anno Domini, during the times of the Roman Empire. On the other hand, from what we have read in the 2021 Religious Freedom Report in the world, it seems that today persecution of Christians is far worse than in Roman Empire times. Is that is this correct? Perhaps Father Hector could say could answer that. I see him nodding. <laughs> well, in fact, when you consider things numerically, um, the twentieth century and the twenty-first century um, are the times when Christians have been and are being most persecuted, and this was affirmed even by by Saint Pope John Paul II. You know, when he was um, in his in his pontificate. And it's very true, because I think, I wonder, every, every 12 minutes or so, a Christian is persecuted and martyred. So that's amazing to think of the numbers. Um, so it is indeed. Um, so Christians are persecuted everywhere. Well, I mean, as I explained, in my, as I shared with you in my, in my brief reflection, well, if we are Christians, baptized disciples of Christ, we are called to be a sign of contradiction. And being a son of contradiction, well, may lead and often leads to persecution. So, well, so nothing new. But of course, it's our duty to pray. It's not that we wish to be persecuted, but it's our duty to pray and to support all persecuted Christians. And the numbers, as we have seen, increase every year. Very good. Well, I believe this brings us to an end. Well, there is a question, Stephen, uh, of um, Sam Atu about um, this um, Christianity expressing love and tolerance. Other religions, especially Islam, is pushing its frontiers by all forms of hijacking national government. In Nigeria, he is referring to Fulanization, Islamization to education and unstopped violence. Your Grace, how would Christians continue on the path of the Great Commission given, to the, given the free decline in religious freedom? Yeah, you see, uh, Sam, thank you. The issue is that we are in a situation of helplessness almost. We feel so defeated that every week or two weeks you find children and students and priests, even religious, being picked up and taken into the bush. And uh, therefore, so long, some are lucky to come back, some are killed. And the bishop, as you know, also suffered uh, that serious um, problem. And my priest was kidnapped for 10 days. He was in the bush. We rushed to the government authorities, the security agents, and there was very little done. We had to struggle on our own to free that priest. And this story is going on and on. So we feel so helpless. And then our people are grumbling that in the government here in Nigeria, nearly every key position, whether in the military or in the civil service, very sensitive positions are all held by people from the same 
uh, ethnic group or same religious group. And Christians are saying, what are you doing, Christian, Christian leaders? We can do very little. Unfortunately, our politicians in the National Assembly who are Christians are not visible. They are not forthcoming. They don't express themselves categorically about their faith. I think we have to handle this politically because we have prayed, we are praying, and we keep appealing in our sermons for justice, for equity and all that. They don't seem to listen. Our leaders representing us in the Senate and House of Assembly and House of Representatives must speak out. They must be bold. They must profess their Christian faith and identity. This is not happening. And I think politically, if we are together, Christians from the North, Christians from the Middle Belt, Christians from the South and the East, if they come together, I think we have a formidable body that can bring justice to Christians who are suffering. Right now, the Boko Haram issue in Maiduguri and elsewhere, there is no end to it. We are tired of even talking about it. We are tired, but it is going on and on. We feel helpless. So your prayers and support are still very, very much needed. I don't know where this will lead us to in Nigeria, but it is quite serious. Very well, thank you, Your Excellency. I would like to thank Father Kabash and His Excellency Archbishop Warda, His Excellency Archbishop Kaigama, Regina Lynch and Father Hector, and all of you who attended and are supporting our persecuted brethren. I would like to ask Father Hector to say a prayer, a concluding prayer, please. Almighty Father, we thank you for having brought us together this evening Although physically apart, we are one in spirit. So we thank you, Lord, for being with us and for sharing so many thoughts and ideas as we continue to pray for our separate, for our persecuted sisters and brothers all over the world. May God give them the courage and may God enlighten us and leaders of all nations to work for peace, solidarity and harmony among all men and women of goodwill. We ask this through Christ, our Lord, the risen one, the victorious one, the good and beautiful shepherd. Amen. 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 One last thing I would like to say is those of you who are interested or would like to have a hard copy of the summary of the report, please do contact us. Get in touch with us either by email on info at acnmalta.org or by telephone on 21487818 and we'll send you a copy by post. Thank you once again. May I wish you all a happy evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Good Thank you. you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. God bless. Thank you. Bye. God bless.